about five or six minutes away from your last chance this week to get $1,000 from the Buzzard Bookie. Start back up again Monday morning with RMG. Still got a couple of weeks left full of keywords. Um, Next week, we'll be out a couple of days, but a lot of good things to give to you. We'll have tickets for the Lamb of God Mastodon show. Uh, We'll put people on Mary's Polar Blast team next week. Snow Babies. Two weeks from tonight, we're back at Boston Mills Brandywine for this year's Polar Blast tubing battle. And um, Rob Reiner back on the show next week, talking about his new project. And the great Billy D. Williams will be here on Friday to talk about his memoir. Uh, Billy D. Williams, uh, depending on how old you are, uh, represents a variety of people. He represents, um, well, Brian's song. A lot of people, if you go way back with him for that. Lando Calrissian. Was he the white guy or the black guy in Brian's song? He's the black guy. We had to watch that in school. You had to watch Brian's song? Mm Mm-hmm. Did anybody like cry? A report on it, I think. Well, they always talk about how that's a movie that like makes people cry, and I didn't know if that was just a Chicago thing or if that's a because mo- it's about Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo, and so I didn't know if that was uh, just like a thing that got people locally Mm-mm. teared up. Billy D. Williams played Gail Sayers, and you had to do a book report on it. I don't know if we had to do a book report on it or if we just I mean, had we, to. We, sh- we, watched we watched it, it in too, school. Yeah. But I don't remember the context of why. But we it was, like, required. We watched it, like, really? four classes in a row. Yeah. We didn't even watch it in school. That's interesting. Yeah, but it was, like, out for, like, two weeks at that time. Huh. Well, yeah. Um, so, anyway, Billy D. Williams next week uh, on the show. You know, um... Some people just gave away those train and REO Speedwagon tickets. And train, about six or seven years ago, did something that a lot of people thought they were heretics for doing. Not everybody's into train, but they did. They covered Led Zeppelin II in its entirety. And it sounded almost blasphemous to do it. But these guys did such an unbelievable version of Led Zeppelin II. It was for charity. Train is primarily a San Francisco band. And they covered Led Zeppelin II in its entirety. So they do Whole Lot of Love. They do the Lemon Song. They do Harper. All of them. And Pat Monahan, everybody in that band, uh, they must have been terrified to do it. I don't know what precipitated the thought to do that. But it is such an unbelievable rendering of that album that it put, at least for me, because that was not a band that was on my radar. Pat Monahan's a talented singer, and you know, but I'm not. I'm not listening to Train. But that version they did of Led Zeppelin II is just phenomenal. You're never going to fully recreate what Led Zeppelin did with that album, but I mean, for any, there's all kinds of of bands covering Zeppelin here and there, and they don't usually nail it like that. So um, if you've never heard it and you're a Led Zeppelin fan, go into it with an open mind, but, man, did they do a good job with that. It's really wild. A kid in Cincinnati is being lauded. This is suburban Cincinnati. Hot on the heels of that uh, porcelain goose being stolen outside Cincinnati. There's a little kid. I think he's only about 10 years uh, old or so. Uh, But they're saying that he uh, probably thwarted a school shooting. Uh, The kid's 15 years old. A 15-year-old kid named Boom Swallen. Great name. This is at Marie Mott High School. Marie Mott is, I don't know if it's Metro Cincinnati or if it's suburban, but it's part of that Cincy Metro area. And he immediately... Despite a threat to him, he immediately alerted the teacher and his parents that one of the other kids in his class told him about his elaborate plan to carry out a mass shooting. These kids just can't keep it to themselves, and thank God he didn't. The The kid in his class, again, I don't know why he told him. I guess he thought that if he scared him enough, because he said, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. 
and the kid later told his dad that um, he wasn't worried about that. He just wanted to make sure that his classmates were safe and that nobody else in the school got hurt. So as a brave kid, under those circumstances, uh, this other kid told him that he had a gun, he had a hit list of students and teachers, and that he fully planned on shooting up the school, and that if he told anyone, he would kill him. Well, the kid goes and tells his dad. The dad calls the cops, and the police said this is, in fact, what this kid was going to do. Uh, they had a journal with codes in it and plans for a shooting. And there were other students that this kid was going to be, uh, I guess, conspiring with. Uh, they had a list of other students that they wanted to kill and rape. Jeez. And um, this kid went to the his dad and uh, who went to the cops and said, yeah, uh, FYI, uh, the kid next to me in school or whatever, they want to try the kid as an adult. Now, he didn't do anything. I'm not How quite sure. He? The uh, the kid who was going to do it is 14. The kid who blew the whistle is 15 years old. They want to try this 14-year-old kid as an adult. I don't know I don't know what the state of Ohio, I don't know what the law is on that. But You know, these school shooters, they always want to try them as adults, but they're not adults. I think the the cutoff, or I mean the starting point, you can be tried as an adult at 14. I think I remember that from when I was. I mean, I would I would imagine that they would know better than I would. I mean, if, if, if those are the charges they're levying, that they probably know you can do that. But again, a 14-year-old kid is not an adult. So, uh, but this kid, you know, clearly stopped something there in Cincinnati. Good for him, man. I just don't understand, <clears throat> like, the no regard for human life whatsoever. And people want to blame, I, it, people blame the guns, they blame the video games, but we had guns, we had video games when I was growing up, and there were way less school shootings. I just don't understand the radicalization of, like, this generation. I, 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 I don't think there's just, like, one reason in particular what do you mean that all these kids are are do, participating in like these mass shootings i don't i don't understand it i don't understand uh, the no regard for human life well uh i think part of it has to do with because they're always guys right they're always boys they're mostly boys and if they're 99 percent men school shooters are all i mean i i don't know if you can find you got to go back to the 70s i think there now, was one woman and then it was, she the, was a lesbian the i don't like mondays <laughs> the i don't like mondays girl from the 70s once in a while you'll have a random girl but it's safe to say it's always guys grown people who are shooters always guys i think part of it at least at the school level is for a long time Girls were getting not that much attention in school. They were falling behind in in math. They were falling behind in reading because all the attention was being paid to the boys because it was just that kind of society. The boys are going to go on. They're going to get a job. The wives are going to have the kids and whatever. And so there was this huge cultural shift probably a quarter century ago to, hey, we should really start – the pendulum swung the other way. We should really start focusing on girls. And so they did that for a couple of decades, and then you had women going to college and graduating and getting degrees at a higher rate than men, which I think is probably currently still the case. What you had then was, allegedly, a generation of boys who would become men who felt like they were getting less attention. So it was like the pendulum swinging, maybe an overcorrection, I don't know. And and I'm sure that's an oversimplification of it. But that's probably got something to do with why a generation of males felt they weren't being paid attention to. But that equates And then you to- throw social media in where everybody's told that if you can't get a girlfriend, it's the girl's fault and not yours. It's not that you're a jagoff who stares at his feet all day long. It's her fault and she but, needs to pay and you know. Again, all everything you're saying could be true, but that equates to mass murder. Like I, I don't know a person that wasn't bullied in school. Everyone on this show was bullied. Well, not right, very, she but was popular, we didn't. But, but we didn't have. We didn't have. At least I didn't. I didn't have access to firearms. We, we, I absolutely did. 
Yeah. No. We, I, mean, I don't know. I, like it's gun, a, I don't know. Guns were around. My favorite game was 007 and Duke Nukem, which was killing, you know, killing pigs and killing people. And but did you what, have access to? Had you wanted one, did you have access to a gun? Yeah. Who had it? Uh, well, it wasn't at my house, but my uncle had a gun, and and we got BB guns for Christmas. That and like that's like what what country kids. But you're do not going to kill someone with a BB gun. But you're practicing but, shooting. But the intent point. was the intent wasn't even there to think about bringing it to school or showing it off or anything like that. Like there, there was no one that brought a gun to school, and it, I don't know. I think I think part of it might be the rise of social media because the more desensitized you get to things in general, and that's what I have to think. The more desensitized you get to, you know, you're able to dehumanize other people, and you go, well, they're not a person anymore. They're just somebody making me feel bad or there's someone standing in the way of what I want and so I'm going to remove them from the equation. And that's what a lot of people do with racism and different bigotries is to demean a certain group of people to make them seem less human or less than the person that looks down on them. You, th there are probably a lot of things, the confluence of a lot of things, increased access to firearms, social media, Fewer and fewer families that could afford to have a single income. Mm -hmm. So you have both parents. I mean, I, not I wasn't able to parent. Well, not able. They just have time. They're both working, mm -hmm. right? So not paying attention, but whatever. It, but again, like I grew Gen Xers, like we were the latchkey kid generation, right? You'd come home, both parents were working. My mom didn't work, so my mom, my dad took us to school. My dad worked. So we were lucky that we weren't, but I had a lot of friends who were latchkey kids. Yeah, I mean, it was like the defining, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, it was the defining stereotype of our generation. We're latchkey kids. You go home, you are making something to eat. Well, it was so you know you're watching TV. It was such a definition that it became not just the definition, but the norm. Yeah. So like my generation, I, I think. You know, Pound Cake's mom was home, but she was working third shift. You're sleeping. Uh, so yeah, she, she was asleep. So she's asleep. Uh, Mary's mom, were, was she home? or? But Well, my parents split when I was in, well, man, I was like, young. I was like in sixth through grade. Elementary school, though. For, so most of your elementary but school, they were though. But they were on opposite schedules. Yeah. So when my dad got home from work, he would take us to school, go to sleep and then my mom would leave for work mm -hmm. so my parents were never in the house at the same time right and was your mom there when you got home from work or from school um not that i mean they I, all i remember is them never being there at the same time yeah. that there was never like on a saturday maybe both my parents would be around but they worked my dad worked third shift and i think my mom worked second which is during the day two to ten or something let me give you this money um a little late on it here. I almost forgot. It's the last chance today, this week, to grab a thousand dollars, a grand, from the Buzzard Bookie. Good luck. This is your chance to bet with the Buzzard Bookie and win one thousand dollars now. Enter this nationwide keyword at wmms.com. Green. That's green. Enter it now at wmms.com. And now, tales from the animal kingdom with Jenna from Poland. My dog is a bitch. This has been Tales from the Animal Kingdom with Jenna from Poland. Hmm. I wonder if she's going to get cut in Lorraine. One of her dog. You think she means... Um... Nope. <laughs> Based on the way Jenna throws around slurs, nope. Okay. She means her dog is a bitch. Yeah, you kind of have to take her at her word, I guess. She's pretty literal. Not a lot of subtext. Oops. Not a lot of subtext with her, but uh, listen, thank you. I, I uh, appreciate her uh, dipping her toe in. I was reading about the mutant wolves, the Chernobyl mutant wolves that have evolved to be resistant to cancer, and they're hoping that they can study them. The mutant wolves... Uh, in and around uh, Chernobyl, show that they're resilient to cancer, and they're hoping that they can study them, and, which is, it seems ironic at best. But maybe there's something there. Just 38 years, a low-level exposure to cesium-137, and you can be cancer-free like these mutant wolves. So they're going to study them. 
You never know what nature will hand over to you. Somebody caught some audio from one of these wolves. See if I can find it here. There it is. Mm -hmm. Ferocious. <laughs> Indeed. The ferociousest. For, for the ferociousest. <laughs> the sounds of cancer free. Right? That's a howl of remission right there. How sweet. I'm going to break. We're going to get to the Bill Squire Friday get down and uh, whatever else we got to get to before we split.